The Azerbaijan I came to in 2000 was quite different from the country I live in now. I came here to teach English, the language used on the drilling platforms that were tapping again the country's vast resources of oil and gas. The country was still finding its feet after emerging, independent once again, from the debris of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Once income from the black gold flowed into the economy, then the landscape here in Baku, for example, began to change, almost beyond recognition. Like many teachers, I probably learned as much as I taught. And I soon understood that for all the progress and wealth, there was still a gaping wound in the country's heart. The wound was the loss of the beautiful lands of Karabakh, following their occupation by Armenia, and the great grief, the grief over Hujali, felt by all Azerbaijanis who regard what happened to that town as a genocide. Hujali, the grief of a nation. During the chaos of that Soviet collapse, the armed forces of neighboring Armenia, aided by renegade remnants of the Soviet army, had invaded Nagorno-Karabakh and seven other regions of Azerbaijan that surrounded it. In the process, all the Azerbaijanis in those regions were either killed or ethnically cleansed. One million of the country's seven million people were now refugees or internally displaced people, IDPs. Those survivors of the invasion mourned over 20,000 of their relatives, neighbors, and other compatriots who had been killed. Armenia has turned occupied Karabakh, famous for its rich nature and historically home to great poets and musicians, into ruins. These are the ruins of the once green and beautiful city of Akdam. After some time, I turned to journalism as a way of finding out more about a country with a fascinating culture, but also more about that wounded heart. And a visit to Shahid Lahirbani Martyrs Avenue, that overlooks the capital, brings home the single greatest tragedy of the occupation. As you walk past the lower lines of gravestones, you notice the common date, 26 February 1992, the day Hojali and his people were erased from the map. I learned what that meant in the only way you really can understand by meeting the people affected and witnesses. Two of them appear later in this film. Yasemin Hasanova, 12 years old at the time and now a teacher of IDP children, and Vale Husseinov, at the time 23, bank cashier, guitarist, and recently married. Please watch and hear what they have to say. Imagine yourself in their place, not as a statistic or a political problem, but as a living person. These two people embody the pain of all Pujari. Is Hojali? Well, open a map of Azerbaijan and look for the eagle shaped country, which has Russia to the north, Georgia to the northwest, Iran to the south, the Caspian Sea to the east, with Armenia and a sliver of Turkey to the west.
Hojali is within the western region of Azerbaijan, known in the west by the Russian version of its name, Nagorno-Karabakh, which translates as mountainous black garden. Mountainous because it is in the southern reaches of the Lesser Caucasus. The name Karabakh, in Azerbaijani Turkic this also means big garden, probably refers to the fertility of its rich black earth. Agriculture was the staple industry. The gloriously golden Karabakh horse and sheep whose wool was woven into the remarkably colorful Karabakh carpets are just two of the much treasured fruits of that land. One of the fondest memories of my childhood is when we went to pick thyme to add to tea and for cooking. And one of the most beautiful days I remember was at a spring called Garagach. It was near our house, very close. We used to fill the kettle from that spring and take it home. It was so pleasant for us that we were doing something for our father. I remember that the most. Kojali itself is on a plain area ringed by those mountains and on the northern bank of the river Gargar. In 1992, the town was strategically placed on the main highway between the region's principal cities, Shusha and Hankendi, and Agdam, the next major city to the east, and then the rest of Azerbaijan. It is on the main railway line and has the only airport in the region. The seasonal migration from lowland Karabakh, Aran, to the mountains involved a substantial passage through Khojali. So, in spring and autumn, the highways were blocked for hours as sheep and cattle were herded across them. Khojali people lived happily, bringing up their families, arranging weddings, and building their farms by honest hard work. Azerbaijanis expelled from Armenia and some of the Ahiska Turks returning from Stalinist exile in Central Asia also settled in Hojali as a new homeland. Hojali was developing and growing, new residential areas were under construction and finally its status was raised to city and regional center, a source of pride to its inhabitants. I was interested in all the national musical instruments, the accordion, tar, kamancha, and gavar, and I could play all of them in some way. But in third grade, I learned to play guitar on one that I made myself from a piece of wood. By seventh grade, we already had a small group, even sometimes played at weddings. I composed a few songs and recorded them, but the cassettes stayed behind in Khojali. My father taught military skills at our school. My sister and I would go and knock on his classroom door and ask him for money to buy something from the school shop. The children sometimes laughed at us, but he always tried to give us what we wanted. But with all the shooting, it was very hard for us to carry on with our lessons, very difficult. At night, we would hide in the basement from the Armenians' artillery fire and bullets. And in the mornings, we would get up and go to school. But in sixth grade, I was only able to go to school for one month. It's almost a cliché now, but there is much truth in Azerbaijani's claim to be true to the spirit of multiculturalism. Here, Islam is the predominant religion, but there is a high level of tolerance and respect for other faiths. As well as some impressive mosques, there are also prominent Jewish synagogues and churches, often enjoying state support. Caucasian Albanian churches and Orthodox, Protestant, Roman Catholic and, yes, even an Armenian church. This multiculturalism 
reflects perhaps the historical effect of the ancient Silk Road and the various foreign armies, travelers, and merchants that have crossed this land from all directions. It is also part of the people's high level of culture and hospitality. The respect offered encourages mutuality and integration. Azerbaijanis themselves are largely a Turkic people, originating from the Oghuz tribes. Their language is identifiably related to those spoken in Turkey, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and parts of Russia and China. And they have developed a deep and rich culture in their own historical lands. As for Hajali, Archaeological evidence of a distinct culture within the region goes back at least to the Hojali Gadabe culture of the 14th to 9th centuries BCE. Some of it excavated by Emil Ressler, a German teacher in Shusha's Realny school at the end of the 19th century. Among his finds was a necklace bead bearing the name of the 10th to 9th century BCE Assyrian king Adadnerari II indicating contact with an empire based some distance to the south in what is now northern Iraq. Other finds, including bronze belts, ceramics and weapons, cyclopean constructions, numerous stone box and kurgan graves, as well as medieval Albanian temples and tombs, and of course, Islamic cemeteries and shrines, are all evidence of continual habitation. While the Askaran Fortress, just along the Gagar River, is a reminder of the 18th century Karabakh Khanate founded by the redoubtable Pana Ali Khan. The first 30 years of the 19th century were crucial to the history of this region. For Azerbaijanis, these years were the beginning of a long process that culminated in the occupation of Karabakh and the massacre of the people of Hojali. In 1828, the Russian Empire triumphed again in a war with Qajar Iran and, by the Treaty of Turkmenchai, moved the border between them southwards to the river Araz, taking in the Azerbaijani lands that were north of the river. The many Azerbaijanis who lived south of the river remained under Iranian rule. However, the Christians, mainly Armenians, who lived there were given the right to move north, and many were planted in what are now Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. The Russians saw their co-religionists as useful allies in maintaining control over the border areas. Thus, they were supported, privileged, armed and promoted, while the indigenous Azerbaijanis were kept subject by various means. It was a situation that was bound to produce conflict. The oil boom at the turn of the 19th and 20th century sharpened competition between states for the riches generated. A growing national self-awareness and cultural enlightenment in progress of a time inevitably led to demands from Azerbaijanis to end discrimination. Armenians were determined to hold on to their privileges, and the development of an ever-expansive nationalist ideology promoted by the militant Dashnak Suçun party led to claims and incursions into many areas of Turkey and the Caucasus. Some dreamed of an Armenia stretching from Black Sea to Caspian Sea. Following the revolution of 1905 in Russia, tensions heightened on the fringes of the empire, especially in Baku, Ganja, Nakhchivan and Karabakh. 1992 was not the only time Khojali people were subjected to genocide. They had suffered this in the past too. Armenian armed groups attacked Khojali between 1905 and 1906 and from 1918 to 1920, inflicting massacres and forcing the local Azerbaijani population out of their lands. The Armenian author, Hofhanis Ter Martyrosian, writing under the pen name Ador, makes no secret of those atrocities in his book, The Armenian-Turkish Conflict in the Caucasus, 
Following the Russian Revolution of 1917, Bolshevik control of Baku drew protests from the local population. In late March 1918, the Dashnak Chun party joined the Bolsheviks in answering the protests with a three-day rampage massacring some 12,000 Azerbaijanis. However, Azerbaijani aspirations succeeded in establishing the independent Azerbaijan Democratic Republic from 1918 to 1920 that was recognized de facto by participants in the post-war Paris Peace Conference. But in 1920, it fell once more to invading Bolsheviks and was taken into the Soviet Union. Armenians reasserted claims to Azerbaijani lands throughout the Soviet period. They could not take Nagorno-Karabakh, but succeeded in extracting a large part of the Zengizhou region, thus separating Nakhchivan from the rest of Azerbaijan. As the Soviet Union weakened in the late 1980s, Armenia relaunched its demands to annex Nagorno-Karabakh stirring hostility within the region as the USSR collapsed. They made use of the forces based in their country to launch a military assault on Azerbaijani villages. An Azerbaijani named Khanuklan, who had a farm in Khojale, was captured while grazing sheep in the nearby village of Noragu, where Armenians lived. They held him for ransom. Everyone came together and managed to collect the money. But when he returned, he was unrecognizable. He had been tortured and beaten so badly that he never recovered to be the man he was before. The Armenian villages around us did not want problems either, but they could not raise their voices against pressure from the Dashnaks. When the Azerbaijani villages nearby were burned, one by one, we knew that Khojali would be the next target. Khojali was one of the Azerbaijani inhabited areas of Karabakh. Documents from the Russian Empire in 1886 and from Soviet sources in 1921 in the South Caucasus record the population of Khojali as being only Muslim Tatars, i.e. Azerbaijanis. The rich cultural materials found here give a clear indication of the historical connection of Azerbaijanis to these lands. Khojali was a key area for the control of Karabakh. It was in the center of Karabakh, on the main road between the cities, towns and villages of the region. The building of the region's only airport there served to increase its strategic importance. Most of the Gorus Lachun Road, the only highway between Armenia and Karabakh, was controlled by Azerbaijanis and it was difficult for the separatists to receive weapons and ammunition from Russian military bases in Armenia. Helicopters were insufficient and cargo planes were needed to transport the weaponry required, so Armenia aimed primarily to take the airport in Hojali from Azerbaijani control. This would facilitate the occupation of all Karabakh. The Hojali operation was also planned to ensure that frightened Azerbaijanis would vacate the rest of Karabakh. Thus, the plan was to massacre the civilian population, as was openly confirmed by Serge Sargishan, then a commander of the Armenian forces and later president of Armenia. In an interview with writer Thomas Duval, Sargishan stated, before Khojali, the Azerbaijanis thought they were joking with us. They thought that the Armenians were people who could not raise their hands against the civilian population. We were able to break that stereotype. 
and that's what happened. These are the reasons why Hujali was targeted. Both the Russian Empire and the Soviet authorities established Armenian settlements around the areas, including Hojali, inhabited by Azerbaijanis. In Nagorno-Karabakh, Azerbaijani villages were separated. The heights around Hojali were in Armenian hands, adding to the difficulties in defending the town. So, what happened on that night? Starkly, this. The evening of 25th February 1992 was similar to those of the previous four months. The regular barrage of gun and shell fire began at around 11 p.m., driving the townspeople into whatever shelter they could find, often into cellars. Armenian military forces had encroached closer and closer, and apart from the shelling, they had cut off supplies to Hojali. The townsfolk had been without electricity and gas for months. No phones, no heating oil, no water supply, no food supplies. Cooking what they could on wood fires. The only way in and out of the town had been by helicopter and no flight had been possible for 12 days. It soon became apparent that that night it was different. The barrage was much more intense and the lights of tanks were spotted on their way to the town. The former Soviet 366th Motorized Infantry, i.e. Tank Regiment, was a significant part of the attack on Hojali. It was based in Hankendi and leading officers were Armenian. Ground troops also attacked from different directions. The force was overwhelming and the volunteer defenders on the perimeters of the town soon realized that the rest of the population had to leave their homes and seek safety wherever they could. It came suddenly, even though Khojali people were already subject to the laws of war. But they never expected such a merciless onslaught from the Armenians. Some of them set off on a difficult trek towards Zahdam. Some were shot by Armenians who were waiting in the courtyards for them to emerge from their basements. This was a genocide committed against our people. Agdam, some 16 kilometers to the northeast, was the nearest safe town. But the main road from Hojali went through Asgaran, occupied by Armenians. The only way open was across the Gargar River, east through the densely forested Mount Katik, and then north across open lands towards Agdam. With snow on the ground, wading across the river took its toll of shoes, clothes, and incipient frostbite. But across they had to go, struggling for their lives. Climbing through the forest, some now barefoot, some trying desperately to keep children from crying, they trudged through the night. On the way, many elderly, youth, and children succumbed to the cold. Towards dawn on 26 February, they emerged into the open near the settlement of Nachivanik. And shortly afterwards, as they straggled across the open land, they were met by a hail of gunfire from Armenian forces lying in wait. Six hundred and thirteen people, men, women and children, lost their lives during that whole hellish night. Twenty-five children lost both parents and were orphaned. Many prisoners were taken and used in later negotiations for barter exchanges.
When it was permitted to recover the dead for burial, it became clear that the Armenians had used knives to cut parts from the bodies. The Times, published in London, shared the truth of this atrocity in its edition of 3rd March 1992. Several of them, including one small girl, had terrible head injuries. Only her face was left. Were the body parts taken as trophies and proof of their heroism? Those who got through and reached safety had to wait in the hope of reuniting with their loved ones or, finally, to identify their bodies. Bagdam was their sanctuary and bore the burden of supporting the survivors. Every pupil loves their primary school teacher. I also loved Afila, my primary school teacher, very much. Afila was one of those killed that night, along with all her family. I wanted to follow her way, and that's why I became a teacher. Now imagine Yasemin Hasanova's experience. Twelve years old at the time and not completely understanding what the nightly shelling was for, she remembered looking for shell cases in the mornings. On that night, her father, Tofik Husseinov, was out leading volunteer defenders who were armed with whatever hunting rifles they could muster. Her mother refused to leave without him, so Yasemin was sent with her uncle and cousins. She got through the river, snow, forest, mountains, and firing squad, but her grandparents, uncle, aunt, and two cousins did not. Her father's body was recovered later from under the snow. He now lies in Martyrs Avenue, a national hero for his part in giving people time to escape. Her mother's body was identified in a picture by a foreign photographer on the internet 16 years later. Her mother was lying near the well in their garden. I could never have imagined that anyone could thank God for the death of her mother. But I am thankful that my mother was not taken hostage by the Armenians. Thank goodness that my mother died that day, instead of being abused by the Armenians. That is some consolation for me. Or think of Valeh Husseinov's memories. His bride of a few months, Sadet, her name means happiness, was shot dead by his side as they ran the gauntlet of bullets. He was captured and beaten to within an inch of his life. His hands held over a gas flame and fingers broken under military boots to ensure that he never played guitar again. How do you explain, how do you feel, recover from being driven from what has been your family's home for generations, from the horror of seeing those dearest to you being gunned down because they were Azerbaijani? Can you imagine? Why, in a world seemingly obsessed with international law, order and justice, is nothing done about the war crime committed against innocent people?
for Azerbaijanis, the massacre of Hojali people in the context of the slaughter of over 20,000 and the ethnic cleansing of a million of their compatriots amounts to a genocide. The Justice for Hojali International Awareness Campaign, launched on the initiative of Leila Aliyeva, Vice President of the Haydar Aliyev Foundation, works for global recognition of the Hojali atrocity as a crime against humanity, and for the perpetrators to be held to account and continues to do so. This is a mother's cry, monument to the Hojali genocide in Baku, the response of sculptors Aslan, Temur, and Mahmoud Rostamov to the tragedy. Every year, millions of people, from youngest to oldest in the country, visit this monument on 26 February. They think about the terrible fate of the individuals and families whose lives were cut short. They think about Hojali. Hojali people also think. They think about what happened to them. They demand justice for Hojali. They look to the future with hope. They raise the next generation in full awareness of their roots and culture. I always tell my students how beautiful it was. I want to walk in our homeland, in the yard where we lived, visit the graves of our relatives, and teach at a school in Khojali. Maybe then I'll be at peace. I look towards the mountains of Karabakh. Hojali is just beyond them, not so far away. I watch seven birds fly freely across the space between, but for so many years, the people of that town could not approach it. That was very strange and sad. However, Azerbaijan has now expelled the invading army in the 44-day Second Karabakh War and reclaimed its lands. And a great return is underway. Occupation and destruction are finished. Liberation and reconstruction promise progress and prosperity for the people and their town of Hojali. I wish them the future they deserve. <laughs>